that worthy? All right, all right. Is there any reason not to praise him from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same? Is it ever inconvenient to praise him at any time? I'm going to read the text for today's scripture and you'll understand why that song is so relevant. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. I think about our prayer life sometimes and I wonder if us as saints in today's world have a mediocre prayer life, average prayer life. Honestly reflect on the time that you spend in prayer and ask yourself, am I praying enough is my prayer life effective because you think about the prayers that were prayed in the bible and the outcome of those prayers and then you think about when you just pray over your food and maybe say a little prayer at night before you go to bed and and maybe your prayer gets a little bit stronger when you have a need. Right. There you go. The That's bills come and due and money's a little short or you feel a little sick. You might put a little extra on the prayer, but 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 the Bible says pray without ceasing or from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Praise him in the morning, the noonday, when the sun goes down. Prayer should be a, have a regular feature all right, all right. in your life. Yes, yes. Makes sense. How can we make that happen? How can we improve upon our prayer life? That's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk about the keys to a strong prayer life. All right. All right. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for ushering us into your presence with worship and praise we thank you lord god for giving us an opportunity to praise you and worship you and, and fellowship this morning and we ask lord god that right now that you open our eyes and our ears to hear from you teach us instruct us yes, and inspire yes. us this morning in the name of Jesus, Father, I humble myself to nothingness that you would be everything in me and that your word would go forth and perform that which you have purposed it to perform and that it would not return back void. Father, we bless you. We honor you. We glorify you and we praise you. In Jesus' precious holy name, we say amen. Amen. amen, amen and amen. amen. Very I've spoken on the topic of prayer many many times and i'll probably speak on the topic of prayer many many times more i don't think you could ever say enough about prayer i don't think you could ever preach enough about prayer and while there are many elements that uh can consist of an effective prayer life today i want to talk about three I want to talk about three keys to a strong prayer life uh, that I think will help us follow the expectation to pray without ceasing. Now, let's be realistic. If you are sitting in a meeting with your boss, you're not sitting there praying while he's talking to you. Right. And, and, and maybe if you are engaged in something that has your attention, you are not uh, out loud praying. But the idea to pray without ceasing, I would like to suggest, means to have a spirit of prayer. All right. When there is an opportunity to pray, you pray. All right. Or when you are making a decision, that decision is prefaced by prayer. All right. When you are about to do something, that spirit of prayer leaves all dependence 
upon God. It is connected to the kingdom network. Think about it. You have we all have cell phones today, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Now, even though we are not always using that cell phone, we might not be on the phone. We might not be sending a text. We not, might not be using social media. That phone is always connected to a cellular network. All right. Right. Whether you're using it or not, the phone is always connected. Verizon's connected to a satellite, AT&T, T-Mobile so is connected to somebody's satellite so that any given time, when you need to use the phone, it's working. Right. 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 At any given time, when you need to send a text, it's working. The spirit of prayer means you are always connected to the Father. You always have a mindset to be in tune with the Father Hallelujah. because you are dependent upon him and not Hallelujah. yourself. All right, All right. All right. And so what that means is we need to move from a passive prayer life to an active prayer life so that we remain connected to our heavenly network. All right. Now, in order to do that, the first thing we need to do is confess our own insufficiencies. We need to confess our own insufficiencies because I would like to suggest that the reason why we don't pray as much as we should is because we think we can do it all on our own. You see, we don't pray as much because we think we've got things under control. I'll go to God for the big stuff. Right, right. <laughs> But this, this, this right here I can handle. I can handle this little attitude right here. I can make up the money at the end of the month somewhere. I, ca I got this under control. And so we don't pray as much. We don't pray as often. We don't pray as actively because we think our own knowledge, our own wisdom, our own abilities are sufficient to handle certain things. And then when things maybe get uh, uh, out of our hands, then we go scrambling. Lord Jesus, I need your help. But when we confess our own insufficiencies, we are reminded that our wisdom on our best day is weaker than God's wisdom. There is nothing you can do without God. All right. We need to be reminded there's nothing you can do, nothing you can say, nothing you can handle. You'll never have enough money. You'll never have enough wisdom. You'll never have enough degrees. You'll never have enough to be sufficient for what God can do. And when we remember that, we put us to the side. See, pride has no place in prayer. Pride has no place in prayer. And so what we need to do is remember that denying our need for Christ is to deplete our prayer life. All right. So we need to confess that we always need the Lord. All right. We will always need the Lord. And when we do that, that keeps us dependent upon God. And when we do that, then we meet, that means we are always in prayer because nothing I will ever do can be enough. Colossians 1.17 says, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. All right. God created all things. Nothing would exist, not even you, without God. And therefore, we must depend upon him. Nothing comes to you without God. You can do nothing without God. You can't speak. You can't talk. You can't walk. You can't think. You can't cogitate. You can't do anything without God. So why depend on yourself? There you go. Jesus said in John 15 and 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I, I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. A, a fruit doesn't just grow on its own. It has to be connected to the tree that it's growing from. And it only can grow from that tree because it's connected to the vine. And if Christ is the vine and we are the branches, we would not exist without him. We can't grow without him. We can't develop without him. So we need the Lord. Yes, we do. We were reminded in Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18, and thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of mine have gotten me this wealth. All right. 
But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto the fathers as it is this day. So even when we become successful, even uh, when we are able to gain something or accomplish something or get something or do something, we have to remember that we didn't do it ourselves. There you go. It came by the power of God. We had a right. successful, Amen. highly successful Women's Day with Women in Red service last week. Right. And it, it wasn't because uh, Sister Sharon did everything by herself. It wasn't because everybody had all the smarts and all the resources. It's because everybody said, we need to work together and put this in the hands of God. Right. Nobody would have ever thought that people in this church would come up and come out and show out and be able to do what we were able to do without the hand of God. And so we thank God for those who, who were inspired by the idea, but we also are reminded that God poured into that to grow the success that came out of it. And so the first thing, again, we need to do is confess our insufficiencies. So once you know that you are deficient, you need to find out who is sufficient. All right. And so when you're reminded that you can do nothing, you've got to find the one that can do something. All right. All right. All right. So the right. next thing we need to do is be consumed by his sufficiency. All right. Once we confess our insufficiency, we must be consumed by his sufficiency. Speak. See, remember, pride has no place in prayer because pride overestimates your own power. Right. Yeah. Pride thinks more about yourself than you really ought to. Right. And so what we must understand is that there's nothing we can do without God. And therefore, when we put more emphasis on ourselves, that means we, uh, we don't believe All right. God. All right, preacher. All right, preacher. All right, preacher. But see, unbelief underestimates the ability of God. While pride overestimates our ability, unbelief underestimates God's ability. We've just confessed that we are insufficient, that means we need to depend on the sufficiency of God. And if we don't believe that God is able to handle our requests, we are not likely to engage him in habitual prayer. That's right, that's right. Right? Because you don't believe. So, so what we must do is be consumed with the idea that God can do anything. When we are consumed, when we are obsessed with the idea that with God's sufficiency, he can do anything, that we are indifferent to any obstacle. All right, now. Who would have walked in today and seen the crowd today and said next week they're going to raise $2,500? No, but we were obsessed right. with the idea that God could do anything. And so when you are obsessed with the idea that God can do anything, there is nothing that will stop us from accomplishing what God has called us to do. See, when you realize that God can do anything, then nothing can get in the way. There is no hurdle. There is no negativity. There is nothing anybody can say or do to prevent you from moving forward right. to what God has called you to do. All right. I'm reminded of when uh, Sarah questioned whether or not she would become pregnant. And she said, at my age... <laughs> At my age, I'm pushing 90. At my age, is there anything? What did God say? What did the angel say? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life. And Sarah will have a son. And then there was a question about whether a rich man can enter into the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, well, you know, with yeah. men, things are impossible. <laughs> but with God, all things are possible. You see, we look at the world today and, and we may look at the circumstances that we live in and say, that ain't never going to happen. I can't see that happening. I just don't believe that that will happen. But when we remember the fact that we become obsessed with the fact that God can do anything, he can save anyone, he can change any heart, he can renew any mind, we are reminded that in him all things are possible. 
So we have to confess our insufficiency, be consumed by his sufficiency, and then be in continual pursuit of intimacy. All right. We have to be in continual pursuit of intimacy. I don't know any successful marriage that said their vows at the altar and never talked to their spouse again. <laughs> at most, they just remain roommates. <laughs> but if you're ever going to have a successful marriage, y'all need to talk. You better talk. <laughs> You need to have a conversation. You need to be a student right. of your wife. You need to be a student of your husband. You need to learn them. Understand what makes them happy, what makes them sad. What 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 buttons should you not push? <laughs> Amen. And so so in, in, in order for things to work, in order for you to have a happy wife and a happy life and a happy house with a happy spouse, you, you need to learn everything you can learn. Talk and listen, because that's how you achieve intimacy. But that has to be a constant process. And that's why, just like we need to pray without ceasing, that's the intimacy that we need to pursue with God. That's the relationship that we need to pursue with God. Praise him in the morning, in the noonday, and when the sun goes down. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Because that's how we find out what pleases God and what displeases God. That's how we find out what he will do and what he won't do and what he's able to do. That's how we find out and interpret his word and rightfully divide the word of truth. Because we are constantly... Constantly in the face of God. That's it. Constantly. All right. Say it. Strong prayer life is essentially a deep love life with Jesus. All right. And if you say, because prayer is not a abstract activity, and I think that's what we've reduced it to today. Prayer is not just something you do because it's something you feel like a Christian ought to do. It's not something that you fit in to the order of worship. It's not something that you do because, well, somebody asked me to pray for them, so I'll toss this out there. It is a regular conversation and interaction with God. And it is not just an action of one, mm -hmm. but it is a communion of two. All right. Because prayer is not just you talking and running down your laundry list of things that you want and need, but it is a, 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 a dialogue between you and God. Mm -hmm. So at some point in your prayer, you need to shut up and listen. All right. <laughs> because prayer is a conversation with God. And that's why even Jesus says in Matthew 6, 5 to 7, And when you pray, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to stand praying in the synagogues right. and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. What Jesus is saying is the activity of prayer is not enough. All right. But you, when you pray, enter into your closet, and when you have shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, do not use vain repetition as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard with their many words. Prayer is not empty rhetoric. Right, right, right. Prayer is not about the logic and the order of the prayer to make it sound good, but it right. is the continual pursuit of God to experience righteousness mm -hmm. and relationship. All right, all right. Jeremiah 29 and 13 says, And ye shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. You've got to put all of yourself into this relationship. You've got to put all of yourself into this interaction with God. Because uh, I was listening to a song, and the song says, Forever is a long time, and that's how long I'll love you. So there should never be a cutoff point between your relationship with God. There should never be a cutoff point between how much you pray with God because forever is how long you ought to love God and that's how long he loves you. Matthew 5 and 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. A lot of translations don't have the do part but I like the King James saying do hunger because it adds action to it. Let me ask you this. 
when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're hungry, <laughs> just acknowledging the fact that you're hungry, right. does that fulfill your hunger? No, it does. If you wake up and you need and you're thirsty and you're parched and you Oh, I'm thirsty. Now, just saying you're thirsty, does that fulfill your thirst? No, if you want to be filled, you've got to get up, go down to the refrigerator, open the door, get you a drink, get you some food, because in order for you to be filled, you have to take action on the need. So blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. It's not just being hungry, but doing something about it. If you ever wanted to be righteous, if you ever wanted to be holy, if you ever wanted to be fulfilled, you can't just be it. You've got to do it, and you've got to chase after God and, and search after God and, 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 and pursue God with everything that's in you. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of the things will be added unto you. Don't worry about anything else. As long as you seek me, everything else will come into place. Everything else will fall into place. And so if you ever wanted to pray without ceasing, that means forget about yourself, concentrate on him and pursue everything you need to know about Christ. Three things. Yes. Confess your insufficiency. Uh, Can be consumed by his sufficiency and be in continued pursuit of intimacy. Right. And if we could do praise him again. All right. Because that's what we ought to do. That's it. That's it. Praise him. That's it. Praise. That's it. Praise. Hallelujah.